Hello, my name is Shalonda Griffin, and I am so excited to welcome you to today's Let's Talk. Now, I'm a community relations coordinator here at Gift of Life Michigan, where we honor life through donation. And the theme of today's Let's Talk is mental health in transplant. It's May, and May is Mental Health Awareness Month. And the premise of this Let's Talk is to discuss the mental challenges that come from the different sides of donation specifically the perspective of a transplant recipient and the perspective of someone who lost a loved one who was on the waiting list. Now today I'll be joined by Sarah Skinton Burlow. She's our guest today and she's also a physician's assistant at CNS Healthcare, a three-time kidney transplant recipient and a Gift of Life Michigan board member. I can't wait to start this, this discussion with her. So let's talk. Welcome to our show today, Sarah. We're so very happy to have you. So thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So before we get started, Sarah, do you want to tell us a little bit about your uh, background as a physician's assistant at CNS, CNS Healthcare? And also my understanding is you work in mental health as well. So if you can tell us about both of those things, we'd love to hear about it. Well, interestingly enough, this is a second career for me. I was a master's trained uh, social worker and I decided I wanted to spread my wings a little bit more and I went back to school and became a physician assistant. I have worked in a community mental health capacity for the last 14 years uh, doing psychiatry, behavioral health, uh, mental health, whichever semantics you want to use for it. Um, I love it. It's an amazing arena that is often overlooked because I don't think enough people really appreciate and understand how much mental health and physical health are immensely linked. I always joke that there's not a separate class or a separate school for psychiatry. I learned at the same time I learned orthopedics and dermatology. It, it's absolutely an integral part of who we are, what we are. Okay, I could not agree more. I was at a community event earlier today and they also discussed mental health. So a lot of what you just said, I heard earlier today. So I'm, I'm learning that more and more people are starting to get that the two do go together, both physical and mental health. And I'm, I'm very glad to, to, to hear that. So you are a three-time kidney transplant recipient, correct? Correct. Okay. Can you share the mental health challenges you faced in having both a chronic illness and waiting for a kidney transplant? I think any time you have a chronic illness, it is going to wear on you in some capacity. I'm not sure in any way how it wouldn't, whether this is the physical health or mental health. It's very difficult to get up and be and do everything every single day. And when you are not feeling well and you're tired and you don't know where you're going to get the energy to even just make dinner, it truly does wear on your psyche. It's you might feel like, oh, I made plans to have coffee with a friend. But then, you know, you made it through the work day successfully enough, got home and you just want to pass out. It's when you have something that's acute, when you have something that's short lived and you know, I will soon be over this, whether you have an ear infection, you have the flu, uh, there's a timeline associated with it. Uh -huh. There's not when you have kidney disease. And that can be, for me, that was very uh, mind grueling. And my first two transplants were living related donors, but my last transplant was from you know a cadaver gift and you know my my angel donor it's very difficult to think every day that you you just want to get through and be able to get that call but then there's the survivor's guilt piece you know the happiest day of your life 
with that that new key to a new life may be the it is going to be the worst day of someone else's life right and that can be very difficult to navigate at times okay okay now let me ask you this post transplant uh what were your mental health challenges tell me a little bit more about your health challenges post transplant i know you just talked about uh realizing that what is probably the best day of your life is the worst day of someone else's life but tell us a little more about where you were in that mental space after receiving those gifts there are so many feels you i would say you you run this magical roller coaster of a depression anxiety um it, it, you kind of like ping pong around a little bit. What I try to remind people is just like physical health. It's not like you're perfectly healthy all the time. You don't have to be perfectly, your mental health doesn't have to be perfect all the time. It can ebb and flow. There can be little triggers of things, um, smells, uh, memories, medication changes. I had several big rejection episodes where I was doing 200 milligrams of prednisone a day. That alone can make you feel a little, a little bit of something. Right. Um, and I didn't want to be around myself. I was, it, I was special. And it's, people don't realize how much, at, in how many ways, all these different pieces, trying to navigate um, time off from work, navigating medication changes, realizing that you lose a little bit of your autonomy while you're healing and having to rely on other people, worrying about whether or not you're wearing your caregivers down um, you know, me mentally and emotionally or, or even physically in some instances. And all these things can add up as guilt. And if you don't navigate these correctly, it can absolutely become symptomatic and invade more aspects of your life. Right. If we don't have these conversations to normalize these feelings, I, we are ignoring mental health. Right. Now, sounds like you were dealing with some very, very heavy things. But um, as someone who works in the mental health field, did having that that knowledge, that education about mental health, did that benefit you in any way while you were dealing with those heavy things? Or were you, or would you say you were still just a person having a human experience, no matter what type of, of education you have? I say my education was a definite plus. That being said, I'm a human. I'm not a robot. I still have to... My philosophy is you still have to navigate these feelings. You still have to feel these things mm -hmm. in order to know where you're going to head to and where you don't want to feel. You, if you ignore things, it will pop up later and become an issue. It, you're not going to ignore a, a chronic cough you've had. Right. Why would you ignore nagging anxiety, nagging depressive feelings? Because either way, whether it's the cough or it's the depression, it can absolutely manifest into something bigger. Mm -hmm. Now, none of us are, are islands out here. We have other people that we're connected with. How did what you were going through affect your family? It's always been you know, my bias or opinion that I do think sometimes caregivers have a harder job than patients. As a patient, I know when I can emotionally shut down, take a nap, do what I need to do to recharge myself. I know what I may need. How do you turn off being a caregiver? How do you turn off wanting to see the best for someone or be, do the best? And I think whether it was my parents, my siblings, uh, my husband, people around me. Everybody wants to be the one that we, I always do like as people, we're nosy people. We want answers for things. We think that there's a reason, there's a purpose. We have to figure it out. But a lot of times we forget that 
the answer is not around the corner. They're mm -hmm. the journey. And I think that caregivers need to pay special attention to what they're feeling and how they're feeling because burnout from caregiving and burnout from not attending to your mental health needs will cause you to, to, to absolutely fizzle out. Right. Now, from what I'm hearing, it sounds like you're very passionate about uh, erasing mental health stig stigmas when it comes to being both the transplant recipient and also as a mental health professional. How do you go about tackling that topic? I'd say there's like different, different arms of that. I talk about it often. I talk about what transplant often. I talk about what it means to have the gift of life. Because I, I'm lucky. I had two living related donors. I was able to get a transplant off the list. Not everybody has that ability or has the timing to be able to do that. I personally feel like it would be remiss on my behalf if I didn't advocate for other people. When I'm saying, hey, look what organ donation did for me. Look, look at the life that I live. Look at the things that I'm doing to better my little environment, my little social community. It's because I want other people like me to live. And I'm, I'm fighting for them. When it comes to mental health, we've done a pretty poor job in the past with discussing mental health. I mean, you don't even have to go back that many decades to see how we used to treat the disease process or treat people um, it, in a lot of ways, like there's a lot of injustice. There's a lot of inhumane ways that we treated the disease, the diseases. I think the only way that we can build up the community of people that are having symptomatology and may be afraid to come and talk about it or get the communities to understand what's going on when we normalize the discussion don't talk about it when something happens we want to think of more preventative measures you don't get grandma help after her eighth heart attack we talk about cardiac prevention we talk about you know, exercise diet doing things so she can build that cardiac muscle we need to look at our brains the same way and not let it be when we have you know family community members neighbors loved ones floundering because we all wanted to sweep it under the rug and not discuss it. Great. Well, sir, thank you so much for everything that you're doing to support mental health in your community. Thank you for trying to erase that stigma as best that you can. And most importantly, thank you for helping people not feel so alone. Because I think that uh, when people are having mental health issues, that's the biggest thing. People feel like they're the only one going through that. And no one wants to stand out as different. So a lot of times we keep things to ourselves. So thank you for helping normalize this because life is, is messy, has lots of crevices and cracks and there's no linear line and you're doing a really great job. So we appreciate you. Well, thank you guys for everything that you do. Well, interestingly enough, I learned that you were a caregiver for your husband who was waiting for a kidney transplant. Correct. I'm hoping that we can talk about what you feel like your role was. How did it make you feel? Do you want to unpack anything that I said? Did you feel like it was spot on? Did you feel like it pertained to you or I was off? Boop. So my husband, Greg, he spent seven years uh, on dialysis and on the waiting list waiting for a kidney. Uh, just a little background. He was a type one diabetic who often dealt with high blood blood pressure. Uh, and he uh, was diagnosed with end stage renal disease and started, like I said, dialysis for seven years. Uh, at first he went in center, but then he started doing dialysis at home and I was his dialysis partner. So I went through all of the training and, you know, just being there to assist him in any way that I could. And it was very challenging because Greg was the first sick person that I ever knew in that close capacity. Uh, fortunately, I come from a family where most people are in, in pretty good health. You know, I, I never really saw anyone who dealt with chronic health issues and I never 
uh, encountered someone who was so young dealing with chronic health issues. Greg was in his 30s when he was diagnosed, and I was also in my 30s as his caregiver. So it was really challenging. It was really hard because I didn't feel like I had anyone to talk to because my friends also were in their 30s and they were healthy, not dealing with any of these issues. Um, so I felt very alone, very isolated a lot of times. And I just felt very, I think for me, what really hurt me the most or bothered me the most with this process is how powerless I felt because this was my husband. Uh, this Greg was six foot tall, 200 plus pounds, muscular guy. He would do any and everything for me. And I wanted to do any and everything for him. And I couldn't. I just wanted to make my best friend better. And it didn't matter what I did. I, I couldn't change things. I remember going to uh, the hospital to get tested to see if I were, if, see if I was a kidney match for him. And I remember being really excited about that appointment because I was not as well versed about donation as I am now. So in my head, I was thinking, I have two kidneys. They work for me. Just go ahead and take one of mine. And it's not that simple. Uh, I was not a match for him at all. And that was heartbreaking because, like I said, I wanted to be that superhero to come in and save the day. And I couldn't. So um, I agree with everything that, that you said earlier. I felt very alone, just very isolated. And being from a uh, community of color, we don't always think about therapy or talking to a medical professional as our, our first line of defense. It's very, you can keep it to yourself. You can talk to your family. You know, you can go to church and pray about it, talk to your pastor or your minister, but we don't need to go out and tell it some complete stranger all of our business. So I was kind of hesitant at first to, to get out there and talk to someone, but I was drowning. I was dying inside. Our whole life was falling apart and I didn't know what to do. So it was, it was very, very challenging. I had a lot of sleepless nights during those, those seven years. When, when did Greg pass away? He passed away on November 24th of 2020. Uh, and here's the thing about that. Uh, Greg was very close to receiving his gift. We had talked to his uh, transplant coordinator at um, U of M maybe about two or three weeks prior to his death. She assured us she had been working very, very hard on his case. And she just knew that, you know, his his number was going to be up soon and he was going to get the gift that he was waiting for. But unfortunately, COVID had other plans for him and he passed away from COVID-induced cardiac arrest. Would you be willing to share with us like how... How did that impact you mentally? How, where did you derive your strength from? That is a very good question. I wish I had a clear answer for you. A lot of that time, in all honesty, is kind of a blur for me. Uh, Greg went to the hospital about actually five days. Before, he went to the to the hospital five days before he passed away. Um, he had come home early from dialysis. I said earlier he was doing at home, but he decided to go back in center. So he was going in center in 2020 and he came home early from a dialysis treatment because he just wasn't feeling well. And he was coughing. He had a sore throat. He came home and took some night well because he just thought, you know what? I'm, I'm coming down with the cold or flu. It's November. It's that season. So uh, he fell asleep on the couch and he was sleeping really hard. So I didn't bother to wake him uh, that night. You know, I just went to bed and let him sleep on the couch. And the next morning I was getting up and making breakfast and I was actually being kind of noisy around the house and he still was not waking up, which I thought was really odd. Like, okay, I know NyQuil makes you sleep, but it's been quite some time. So I go over there, I'm shaking him. I'm trying to wake him up. He's not responding when he finally does wake up, he's looking at me like a deer in headlights and he's unable to speak. He's just very confused. He's basically grunting. He's not verbalizing anything. Uh, so long story short, I called 911. The paramedics came to take him. Uh, the hardest thing about that was 2020, as we all know, is the year of COVID. So I, I couldn't 
I, I was not allowed to stay there. I was able to go to the hospital just because, you know, he couldn't talk. I could give them all the basics. Once he tested positive for COVID, I was ushered out, out the hospital and I never saw him again. Uh, he never spoke the entire time he was in the hospital. I would call, I would ask the nurse if they could put the phone up to his ear. He couldn't speak. Um, I could briefly talk to him, but nurses were really busy. They had a lot of other patients to tend to as well. So they couldn't spend a lot of time with us. And like I said, five days later, I got a phone call saying, we're sorry, but your husband went into cardiac arrest and we did everything he, we could, but he passed away. So that was, to answer your original question, I really have no idea how I was able to make it through that because as someone dealing with a chronic illness, obviously he'd been hospitalized before, but he always pulled through. So when he went to the hospital this time, I'm thinking, okay, so he'll be in the hospital two, three days, then he's going to come home. He's going to pull through like he always does. But that wasn't the case. And also with it being uh, 2020, uh, I was isolated in so many, so many ways. I mean, friends couldn't come over, families couldn't come over. Even for his funeral, we were only allowed to have 25 people. And that was including uh, the people from, uh, from, the, from the funeral home. So I am a person of faith. Uh, God and I had a lot of conversations during that time. We're still having a lot of conversations now. So I'm going to say uh, any strength that I possessed during that time totally did not come from me. It came from above because Shalanda just wanted to crumble up on the floor in a ball and cry and shut out, shut out the entire world. Yeah, it it just hits my stomach just thinking it's it's that that caregiver role. You caregivers are often overlooked carrying so much emotional baggage mm -hmm. and trying to do so many pieces. That it, I, yeah, yeah. And the thing about that too is when you're a caregiver, when people reach out, they reach out and they want to know how that person with the illness is doing. And I get it that I want him to have all the attention. Um, and people don't really think to ask how you're doing. And I was the person who I didn't want to complain because I was the healthy person. What did I have to complain about? I wasn't on dialysis. I could eat whatever I want. No medications like Shlanda, you, you're blessed in so many ways. Don't complain. So a lot of things that I wanted to express, I didn't because, like I said, what, what do I have to complain about? Please give him all of the attention. He's the one who needs it. It's very difficult to, it, it's a fine line, whether you're a recipient or a caregiver, of not wanting to not seem thankful for your gifts. Mm -hmm. But when we do that, like you said, it's you fall to the wayside. Mm -hmm. So like when you do have those darker moments or when you do have those those heavier thoughts, how do you how do you resurface victoriously? What are the I know you said your faith. Is there anything else that you do to not fall in these traps? So in the early stages, and this is probably not the best advice, but this is just me being honest. I was a person who kept my plate very, very, very full. I did a lot more than what I needed to be doing because if I stayed busy, I did not have to think about it. Um, so I did all the things, <laughs> not even things that I necessarily enjoy, but like I said, just things that kept me busy. Uh, but as time went on, I realized, you know what, Shlanda, you cannot do this alone. And I did seek out a medical professional. Um, I got a therapist. Uh, at first, I went through uh, therapy here here in my work. Our, I always forget what it's called. Our EPA, I believe is what it's called. Mm -hmm. um, so I went EAP, thank you. So I reached out through that and I found a medical professional a therapist who could help me. Um, everything was, was online. And I remember our very first meeting, I am trying to hold everything together. 
uh, and just seemed like, you know, I'm going through a tough time, but I'll be okay. And she stopped and she looked at me and she said, do you want to cry? And I said, yes. And as soon as I said it, I just bawled like a newborn baby. And just the fact that she allowed me to take that time to let all of those feelings out. Um, I remember her saying to me, I can tell that, that this is something you've been needing to do for quite some time. But um, that was something I was struggling to do because I wanted to be strong for everyone else. <laughs> well, I'm I'm very glad that you... The first step, honestly, is recognizing what needs to be done. And it doesn't mean... And I love when you said, this may not be the best advice. You, you recognize this was the problem. This is how I dealt with it. This is... It, life's a journey. There's no book. Mm -hmm. And if there was a book, there would be a book. Go to the self-help section. Tell me what you see. Rows and rows of books. Right. It, it's a matter of finding what what fits in your life. Uh, so that being said, now looking back, what what would your advice be to people like you as a caregiver or the, or the dynamics that you and Greg had together? What would your advice be for people in similar situations? Don't be afraid to ask for help and don't be afraid to accept help. If you have a friend who says, hey, can I come by and maybe wash your dishes or can I bring dinner to you or can I babysit your kid? Don't be so prideful that you can't say yes to those things because like you said earlier, you're a person, you're not a robot. There's only so many things that you can handle. So let people help you. Uh, do not be afraid to look for help. Uh, and also just understand uh, that with, with therapy, there is no one size fits all. So I had a therapist in the beginning to help me with my grief, but as my grief started to, I don't wanna say go away because that hasn't happened, lesson, uh, I needed someone to talk to me more about widow widowhood, less about grief, more about widowhood. And while that first therapist was great when it came to helping me through my grief, she wasn't really great with helping me navigate through widowhood. So I have a completely different therapist for that. Um, so I don't think there's anything wrong with shopping around to find someone who is a good fit for you. Also, do not be afraid to ask for what you want in a person. Um, I specifically wanted to talk to an African-American female therapist. Um, I wanted someone who I felt would be able to really, really relate to me on more ways than one. Um, and I remember making that phone call the first time and saying, I don't know if this is a really rude thing to ask and please forgive me if it is, but this is what I would like. And I remember the rece receptionist saying, no, people ask for, you know, male, female, all the time. It's not a big deal. So don't be afraid to advocate for yourself and get what makes you comfortable. Uh, and just be honest with your, with your emotions. I mean, if you don't have a trusted friend or a family member, journal, write your, write what you're feeling down, put it into words and don't be afraid to feel what you're feeling. There is a Walgreens up the street from me, and I think every single person who works there has seen me cry <laughs> on so many different occasions to the point where they'll see me and they're like, oh, she'll be okay. She just needs five minutes on aisle five and she'll be fine. Um, so don't be afraid to let, to let it out. Uh, I find that a lot of people think that crying is a sign of weakness or people cry and they apologize for crying. You don't have to apologize for crying. I mean, it's, it's okay to, to feel all of the things. Um, but yeah, just, just acknowledge where you are in and do what you can from there. Then piggybacking on a piece that you said that I think may be important or like maybe empowering for other people, the accepting help piece. I think a lot of people think if they accept help, help and and perhaps this is my like myopic bias, but sometimes as females, we feel like we have to take it all on. This is our role. We're caregivers. We can do it all. By accepting help, it doesn't mean that there's a deficit on your behalf. Perhaps that's the only way. 
Aunt Margie can help you by doing dishes. So she can feel like she's contributing to the process. Right. She can feel like she's giving. And that's her caregiving capacity. It's, we all exist in this wonderful symbiotic relationship called life. Right. And I think it's absolutely integral that we, we rely on one another. So kind of like wrap up everything that you've been saying. How have your like life experiences motivated you or made you a better employee in your role today? Well, full transparency, after Greg passed away, I wanted to quit Gift of Life because it was too hard. Don't get me wrong, I'm always, always happy for, for recipients, for those families who get that second chance. But when you have that same need in your household and it doesn't come to fruition, it's really hard. Um, so I wanted to quit. But fortunately, I work with a really great team of people who are able to talk me off the ledge, so to speak. Uh, the work that I do is a tribute and a love letter to my husband every single day. Um, one of the thing that one of the things that gets me through is knowing how proud of the work that I'm doing. He was so very proud of the work that I'm doing. I remember him verbalizing to me, "I'm so very proud of the work that you're doing." So that is what drives me, uh, and also because I understand what it's like to have someone you love get really, really sick and for you to get really, really scared and not know where to turn or what to do. And and you just don't know what the end looks like. So I can really relate to those families. And the way I look at it, if I can just help one person, one family not go through what Greg and I went through, then I've completed my purpose. Um, I often say that I've been fortunate enough, I don't know if fortunate is the right word, but it's the word I'm going to use right now, uh, to turn my my pain into passion. And that is what drives me every single day. Like, gosh, this hurts. This really, it sucks. But this is what gets me up in the morning because I don't want another family to deal with this hurt. I don't want another family to deal with this pain. I don't want another wife to have to say that say goodbye to her husband or for a mom to say goodbye to her kids. And every now and then um, I am, uh, I'll meet someone in the community who will say to me, hey, you came to my school or you came to my church a year and a half ago. You probably don't even remember it, but I joined the registry because of you. Or my loved one was diagnosed with organ failure and Yes, it's scary, but I remember what you said, so it makes it a little less scary. So I'd like to think that uh, Greg is is always with me in the work that I do. Um, He's even more proud that I've I've stayed the course. Um, And yeah, I just, I love the community. I love the people in it. And my love for people is just what, what continues to drive me. Well, I wish you many years of continuing in your role. It's what you think for every one person you're touching, they're potentially touching three to five people. So think about hundreds and hundreds of lives that you're changing. You don't even realize it. Yes. Thank you. I appreciate that. Sarah, thank you so much for being here with us today. You were a delight to speak with. Thank you so much for taking time out and sharing your story with us today. We really appreciate it. No, thank you. And thank you for your amazing transparency and like soul bearing. It, it, hearing other people's stories are really what help us all get through. Yes, we are all in this together. I couldn't say it better myself. Uh, And for our audience, uh, like I said, please remember we are all in this together. We are hoping that either Sarah or myself said something that was helpful for you today. Uh, If you're someone who is dealing with some really hard issues and maybe you feel like you don't have anyone to talk to or maybe you're feeling alone, I would encourage you to reach out to someone. Uh, On the bottom of our screen, we've uh, included the number to the National Mental Health Hotline. 
This is a 24 seven hotline that is there for you when you need them. So please, please, please do not hesitate to call if you need them. Uh, thank you so much for being with us today. We hope that you have an amazing rest of your day and we look forward to seeing you next time. Bye-bye.